Okay, we were talking about Paul Revere and the actual history of it. And this is a short snippet from Encyclopedia Britannica. I would suggest, however, if you want a more something a little more in-depth, you might read Longfellow's poem, uh, Paul Revere's Right. Okay? Now, this is what uh, Britannica has to say about it. One of the reasons I'm using Britannica is because nobody can hack it. Well, I wouldn't go that far, but well, you know what I mean. <laughs> it has to do with the Battle of Lexington and Concord, April 19, 1775. Uh, let's see. General Thomas Gage, recently appointed royal, royal governor of Massachusetts, ordered his troops to seize the colonist militia stores or military stores at Concord. En route from Boston, the British force of 700 men was met on Lexington Green by 77 local militiamen and others who'd been forewarned of the raid by the colonist uh, efficient lines of communications, including the ride of Paul Revere. It is unclear who fired the first shot. That, my friends, is what Paul Revere is noted for. It's not noted for warning the British which would have been a act of Tory treason against the uh, colonist. But he uh, is known for warning the colonists that the British were marching on them. So, that's uh, just a little piece of history for you. Real history, what really happened... Uh, there is some evidence, and I don't have it here, so I'm going to let it slide. But there is some evidence that the uh, colonists in the Boston Tea Party had actually absconded with uh, two royal cannons. And part of the raid to acquire the military stores of the colonists was to reacquire those cannons. I saw this on... History Detectives, I believe, uh, last year sometime. Not quite sure. So if you uh, come across that in the uh, PBS show History uh, Detectives, uh, you might find that interesting as well. Okay, so there we have it. Now, <clears throat> that's, that's the gist of what Paul Revere's contri contribution to the uh, American rebellion against the British authorities, uh, the first American Civil War. Me now. Sometimes I feel a little mad. But don't you know that no one alive can all... Okay, at this point I want to take on some uh, headier stuff. We're going to touch on the concept of the social contract and then go right into the preamble to the Constitution of the United States. Okay? And the reason for that is you need to understand what the base philosophy is for understanding what was trying to be accomplished in the Constitution as defined by the preamble. So we're going to cover both of those. And that's the beginning of what one might call Civics 101 Cliff Pot style. Uh, as always, more than happy to you know get some input. More than happy to hear from you. Let's uh, get on with it. Give me a second here. Okay, uh, I'm quoting from Wikipedia simply because it's available. It's not an authentic, uh, unauthorized source. It's good for color commentary. It's good for finding links that will lead you to other places. It's good for general overview, but it's not particularly peer-reviewed. And as such, it's uh, pretty plebeian or public as you get when you look at the article about uh, Sarah Palin's uh, devotees, as it were, trying to rewrite history on the uh, Wikipedia page to match whatever gaffe Palin said. Okay, en enough of that. Let's get on with social contract. This one paragraph will explain a lot. The social contract is an intellectual device intended to explain the appropriate relationship between individuals and their government. Social contract arguments assert that individuals unite 
into political parties by a process of mutual consent, agreeing to abide by common rules and accept uh, corresponding duties to protect themselves and one another from violence and other kinds of harm. And that is a very, very good explanation. I don't know who wrote it, but nice work, nice summation. Now, uh, Cliff Potts style on the social contract is quite simple. Uh, the Cliff Potts style on the social contract, it is the unwritten set of rules and laws that we have that dictate how we address one another in a civilized society. Now, I said unwritten because often while we while the written law does reflect the social contract to protect one another from violence and other kinds of harm there are also rules in a social structure that also dictate uh, and protect against such but they also dictate when it is excuse me, viable and acceptable to inflict harm on others, which, by the way, is very rare in the social contract of the United States. We'll scream at each other, we'll yell at each other, we'll call each other horrible names, we'll say nasty things about each other, we'll be as mean as possible, but for the most part, we do not inflict harm. It's one of the great things about the United States. And it is a great thing. I'm not saying other nations haven't been more civilized in this regard. I'm just saying that when you look at just how badly, how, how little we think of one another sometimes, and how badly we treat one another sometimes in regards to our opinions of them, we really do tend to stop with flapping our gums, which, quite frankly, is probably a good thing. I say probably, because there are times when you need to do more than flap your gums. You take that and do what you want with it, and I'll get on with this. So, because we have a social contract, we hammered this out back in the... you think I'd have this memorized back in the 1880s. The preamble to the Constitution sets forth what the objectives of the Constitution, therefore the objectives of the federal government are. It states, and I quote, we the people of the United States, and remember the social contract is the agreement by mutual consent of what the people and the government will do together. Okay? We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, and mind you, that's not a perfect union, but a more perfect union, trying to do something better than what has been done elsewhere at other times. Establish justice, so that means fairness across the board. Justice is arguable, that's a whole different philosophical question. It has to be dealt with in depth later. Ensure domestic tranquility, that is where we don't ch kill each other. Provide for the common defense. This is an action where we, where we are taking to build a body to keep others from harming us as a nation state. Promote the general welfare. That means to get out there and make sure that the mass majority of the people in the United States are doing well and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity to ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. And again, this goes back to the earlier video. we got a lot of people, right and left, saying we don't have liberty. Excuse me, please, I, I'm almost begging you, tell me what exactly you have lost that you're looking for. I know there's issues. I've talked about this already. I know this is not perfect. I've talked about this already, as I said. But I want to know where exactly you feel you are losing your liberty. What is it that you want to do?
do that you cannot do because the government is interfering with you. That's what I want to know. Okay? And having said that, I'm going to cut this. In another video, which will be launched later today, I deal with Obama's accomplishments in office as of July of last year. Right now, let's keep this tight. Stick to this, okay? As always, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. And may your God go with you. And on this day, June 6th, 2011, take a moment to pause and reflect and remember the hundreds of thousands who died in the last great world war. Thank you. Have yourself a good day. Bye-bye for now.